Hi, I'm Nicola Jennings, one of the co-founders of Athena Art Foundation. This is Athena Asks, a podcast where we talk to artists, curators, historians and collectors about their work, pre-modern art and the world today. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Madeline Haddon, curator at the Victorian Albert Museum and member of the Brain Trust of the Athena Art Foundation. And I'm delighted to have as our guest today two brilliant and dear colleagues, Dr. David Pullins, Associate Curator of European Paintings at the Met, and Dr. Vanessa Valdez, Associate Provost for Community Engagement at the City College of New York. So we're coming to an hour, and I want to keep you both more, but I want to ask one final question that links in the show at the Hispanic Society that Guillaume Keynes, director of the museum, and I have worked on, entitled In Search of Juan de Pareja, from Oturo Schomburg to Jazz Night, and is now on view at the Hispanic Society. Guillaume and I have seen this show as part of an important continuation of the celebration of Juan de Pareja throughout New York City but also, you know, including the Hispanic Society as an important institution as well within this dialogue around Juan de Pareja that's been happening since the beginning of the 20th century. So within the exhibition are two works in the Hispanic Society's collection which are really critical to aspects of this story. One is a portrait that has been previously attributed to Juan de Pareja, and the other is a copy of Velazquez's portrait of um, Pareja, which was very well known to Schomburg. The exhibition also includes um, a copy of Velasquez's Portrait of Pareja that was created by contemporary artist, fantastic contemporary artist Jazz Knight in the Met's galleries, um, and a video of Jazz's process creating the work. And part of the reason, uh, there are many reasons wanting to, you know, to show that work in, um, in this exhibition at the Hispanic Society, but also to think about this kind of historic tradition of the copy and how artists have been learning through copies for um, centuries and and jazz really speaks beautifully about how that process of copying the work of another artist allows you to almost enter their mind and um, enter their their psyche and, and their process and how that's been really important to his practice. And this is a process that, as we know, was would also been true for Velasquez and Pareja themselves. So a little bit of background. Have you, both of you, thought about ways in which the copy can help us glean insights that are possibly impossible to consider otherwise into kind of the more personal dynamic and relationship between Pareja and Velasquez. I started thinking about this in part because friends and family of mine who visit the exhibition have asked me, well, I'm going to share a question that you, you both have been asked, what do we know about the kind of feelings and relationship of Velasquez and Pareja towards each other. And obviously it's impossible to to know that, especially not from the voice of Pareja um, himself. So it started, got me thinking about ways in which thinking about their experience painting together and the copy being a vehicle that you think we can glean any insights into their relationship. As you know, I came to know Jazz's work because he was, this was before the pandemic, actually, he had written to the department here about copying the Velasquez portrait and then the pandemic happened and then he came back and, and when he, it was in a discussion with him that I realized he has such a wonderful sense of the intentionality around, you know, just thinking about what does it mean to produce copies? How, how is that a learning process? And so it was in the context of that when he, he wanted to make, we have an entire program here at the Met, copyist program where people come and, and if it's logistically possible, uh, you know, they set up their easel and they paint. And I really understood early on with jazz, I thought, well, we should try to, I got our digital team to make this video and the end sort of almost like a short documentary uh, about him because basically his thought process in doing that uh, was so meaningful uh, and so indicative of how, as you say, Velasquez and Wanda Preha themselves were trained in a world in which copies were standard. There's also, you know, in the exhibition is a painting that I propose is maybe the earliest thing we have by Wanda Preha, and it's a portrait of Philip IV, but based on a head that would have been by Velasquez. And so that's, you know, standard workshop procedure to have this head and then you pass it around and different people in the workshop make copies. Uh, and so in that sense, there's a kind of intimacy to to that learning process that I think, you know, I mean, as Jazz has said, when he was copying our painting, you come to know that painting in a way you simply never could if you just stared at it. As you say, it's impossible to to know what the relationship between, and we get this question all the time, well, what was the nature of the relationship? It, we have no idea. But again, intimacy is the word that comes up for me in part because no matter how much love, hate, resentment, whatever might have been there, 
you are talking about someone, they essentially lived together for 25 years. I mean, it's, it's kind of a wild thing. They were traveling together. I also think of people anytime in someone's domestic space, like that kind of habitual day in and day out aspect of their relationship. Um, you know, I think, and it's something we, as you know, we're really keen on and, and Vanessa can speak further to that about people want to read out of the Velasquez portrait of Juan de Preja, friendship, respect, esteem. Sure. Maybe or not. <laughs> I mean, it's also, I mean, he's a painter. It's, it's a representation. It, it, it's, it's not, it, it, you know, it's a document of, I mean, frighteningly enough, it's also a rare instance in the history of art that is literally capturing the enslaver's gaze. I mean, this is such a weird object. It is literally a portrait of someone he owns. It's, it's such a, how often does that happen? It's a very, very strange thing. Uh, and so to whatever extent, uh, there's kind of ennobling all of these words that are used for that portrait. We try to steer very clear of and try to be very cautious uh, in our language around reading too much into Velasquez's feelings for respect for, etc. for Wanda Preja through that painting. Because it's quite tempting because the painting's so beautiful, so compelling. But. Well, and I think, I mean, that's also how people have written about that portrait, right? Ennobling, he's dignified. You know, it's the reason why uh, for me, for both of us, it was really important to put how Juan de Padeja pictures himself on the cover of our catalog and then put the more the, the portrait that people are more familiar with on the back cover, right? Because it does beg the question, who do we trust? Whose vision of this man do we trust? Do we trust the person who owned him or do you trust the person and how he portrayed himself? And for me, again, David earlier said that I and more comfortable with the open questions, it is true. That is how one also gets people involved in terms of thinking about these things for themselves. As far as the involvement with the Hispanic society, we know that Arturo Schomburg could not have seen the Velasquez portrait that, that the Met purchased because it was in fact owned by British nobility. Um, and so if he did see one, it would have been the copy that is at the Hispanic Society. And so we employed a research assistant, Cheyenne Marcano, to dig through the archives at the Hispanic Society and see, you know, is anything come up? She was also at the Schomburg Center itself. I and mean, there's so much in terms of his correspondence that is left to glean about him and his interactions. You know, one of our greatest dreams would have been to have, to really have this be a New York City summer of 2023 galvanizing exhibition whereby you could go to all three spaces, which you still can, of course, but, you know, to have had an exhibition at the Hispanic Society, one at the Schomburg Center, and one at the Met, you know, and, and really these bringing together these histories of Northern Manhattan with, with Midtown, um, or the Upper East Side. That was really important to us. I love that you start with Arturo Schomburg. It's like a baton that the Met exhibition does and the, what the Hispanic Society's exhibition does. You know, the other fascinating thing was in working with Tammy Lawson, who is the curator of the Division of Art and Artifacts at the Schomburg Center, she had mentioned that there was yet another copy of, of Alaska's portrait at the, in, in their collection. And that was one that was painted by Pastor Argudini Pedroso, who's an Afro Cuban painter. And so, we were like looking to see what that looked like in the Schomburg Center. And what was even more fascinating was the story behind that painting, which was that this was a painter who was a friend of Arturo Schomburg, who was in Cuba. And Arturo Schomburg helps to arrange his passage from Havana to New York. He goes to the Hispanic Society to make a copy of the Velasquez portrait. And the staff at the Hispanic Society did not bring the portrait down. And so he wound up painting it on a ladder. <laughs> and so for me, that backstory is way more fascinating than the actual object itself, because that also is a snapshot of what 1930s New York looked like. What do we do with an Afro-Cuban immigrant who speaks Spanish and is trying to access that space? The Velasquez portrait of Juan de Padeja has such deep emotional registers, like across time. You know, Herman Bennett, who was also on our advisory committee, he has that portrait on the cover of his study on colonial Mexico. I mean, you know, Miriam Acosta Willis, who was foundational in Afro-Hispanic studies, she has that portrait on the cover of her study. Across time and space, but particularly of peoples of African descent in Latin America or those who study that area, the Velasquez portrait of Juan de Padeja is affecting, you know, drawing out all of those histories 
what I commend you for drawing on that history and all of those, again, resonances and the effects of that portrait for many people. Well, thank you for your help with telling that story because the research that you and Cheyenne did were really critical to contextualizing um, both of those works from the Hispanic Society's collection. And, and Vanessa, to your point in the Augustine and Pedroso painting, the power of that story of how it was created, but also that we have that crystallized and the fact that it's not finished. I've gotten that question in, in a number of times from the few people who have seen it so far. And why is it not finished? And you know, how could he have finished it? I think he did absolutely the best that he could given the circumstances, but that story is lost um, otherwise. So it's been great to be able to to recover that um, again. And that led perfectly into my last question, which is going to be just to speak a bit about you know, the relationship between Schomburg and the Hispanic Society and what you and Cheyenne were able to ultimately find. And then thinking about Schomburg's relationship with the Hispanic Society in Huntington got me kind of thinking about what was his relationship with other major collectors in New York at the time, like Henry Clay Frick and J.P. Morgan. I know from having spoken to you personally, there's so much more research that I think didn't necessarily all make it into the essay and the catalog, broadening the conversation for you know myself and other future scholars and, and you and all of us to run with that in the future. Whatever you've been able to find around that would love yeah, to know. Yeah, I mean, the thing about my involvement with telling Arturo Schomburg's story is that for me, it's a decade long process. So sometimes you get very close <laughs> to the material, right? And what the, the the writing of the essay in our catalog calls me to do is to kind of back up a little bit. I'm in the weeds here <laughs> sometimes. And so I think again, what's, what's really important to emphasize with regards to Schomburg is that this was a working class man who is known within African-American circles in New York City. You know, he is a clerk in a bank for 20 years. This is not a man who's on par with J.P. Morgan, for example, right? There was a moment there when we were talking about the labels where I included that he worked as a bellman and as a porter, that someone said, well, why are you including that? And I said, this was not a learned man. This was not Elaine Locke or W.E.B. Du Bois. Although these were his, you know, these were his colleagues, right? Charles S. Johnson, who was the editor of Opportunity Magazine, who was another, which was another important um, literary journal of the moment. That was his, one of his closest friends. These were the PhDs, right? These are like the graduates, you know, Du Bois, Locke. These are the first and second graduates, African-American graduates of Harvard University. Atula Schomburg graduated from secondary school in the Caribbean. He didn't have that access. And again, it being Jim Crow in New York City, even his relationship with the Carnegie Corporation was also mediated, right? Because he was working in the 135th Street Branch Library with Ernestine Rose, who is the white head librarian. He's working with the structure of the New York Public Library, the donors of the New York Public Library. You know, he spends time at Fisk University for three years after this moment, um, and he's working with those who founded the NAACP, those who donated to and underwrote financially HBCUs such as Fisk University were often white, rich peoples. Um, and so, again, all fascinating moments in our history, in U.S. history, that is not very well known. And certainly the investment in terms of a philanthropic sector in African-American institutions of higher education, in um, you know, something like the Harmon Foundation, which was critical in terms of um, art production during the Harlem Renaissance, right, by gifting um, prizes for artists, all of that is for specialists of the Harlem Renaissance, they know about it. But in general, we, we, we haven't, I think, in U.S. history, really drawn all of those narratives out. Cheyenne was trying to see if Arthur Schomburg had gone to the Huntington and the ledgers for those years at, at the Hispanic Society are lost, or they haven't been found yet, but they're not kept. So we couldn't definitively place him in those spaces. But again, what we do know is that he, he was... Before he goes to Spain in 1926, he knows about the Velasquez portrait. He knows about the Colón de St. Matthew. He's done all of that research. He's well aware of the 19th century bibliography, certainly that David includes in the footnotes to his biographical sketch, Juan de Pareja. <laughs> There's always more to be learned in these gaps in archival research. You know, the, the photograph in quest of Juan de Pareja that illustrates the painting, illustrated is in fact the Hispanic Society painting. It's not the one at the Met 
I wonder if you would have written to the Hispanic Society to ask for either a photograph or the permission to reproduce it. That might be a, a kind of link. I mean, you had to obtain the photograph somehow. Or that would be in the Du Bois archive at the University of Massachusetts Amherst because it's the NAACP's journal. Ah, oh, right. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. No, there are definitely threads. And also, I guess it would be interesting for Frick. I don't know if, Madeline, if you had asked them. There are questions I, I it really got me going thinking about over the past couple of months that, you know, I want to continue to think about and pursue further. Again, that kind of going back to that statement about there's so many different, so many more stories that need to be told, brought up brilliantly by this exhibition. Vanessa, David, thank you so much for being in conversation with me today. This was absolutely um, fascinating and I'm really grateful for your time and um, congratulations again on a fantastic show. <laughs>